Hello, welcome to the Bearded Tits podcast, hosted by me, Jack Perks. Professionally, I'm a wildlife cameraman, but I dabble in podcasting, and each Tuesday we release an episode as I have a chat with scientists, artists, filmmakers, and passionate people all about nature in a light-hearted and certainly not serious way. Hello and welcome to the Bearded Tits podcast. I'm your host, Jack Perks. Now today we're talking about intellectual rights with regards to wildlife locations, maybe the gear that you use and how you do it. I know what you're thinking, this is a bit fucking heavy for a wildlife podcast. This is really more aimed at wildlife photographers and filmmakers and I'm going to talk about why you might not want to give away locations, what gear you use, how you use it and some of the reasons like that. This is sort of prompted by recent comments I've had where basically I get bombarded with people asking me, how do you do that? Where do you do it? And generally speaking, I don't say shit. And rather than sending a message, I thought I would do a podcast because I'm sure people think I'm an absolute asshole for not telling them. And I want to just sort of explain why I don't tell them in some cases. Sometimes I tell people. It depends. Now, if you want to support the podcast, you can do so on buymeacoffee.com. This podcast is not sponsored, and the only way that we make money is through your donations. So if you can, that's my little dog trotting in. If you can donate whatever you can afford to that, there's a link down in the description. That is greatly appreciated. We're currently trying to raise £1,000, and this is so it can set me up to travel all around the UK and meet people in person because I've found when I've met guests the podcasts really flow and they've just got this extra little something to it. Now it's called buymeacoffee.com and the idea is you you give the same amount as you would buy them a coffee. Most of the podcasts that I do are generally uh, recorded in the morning however it's half five so maybe a little bit early but I've cracked open the scotch in my cupboard and I'm going to introduce you to the best sound in the world which is Oh, that is pure sex. That is me opening a lovely bottle of scotch, which is... I'm going to pour it into the glass now. Oh, that is just pure sex. It is Talisker Storm, which is my absolute favourite scotch in the world. So really, I should sign up to buymeascotch.com, although I feel like I wouldn't get a lot of work done. I'm just going to put a little drop of water in. People who don't drink scotch will think that's an absolute disgrace. However, for all of us scotch drinkers in the know, you know that adding a little bit of water opens it up. I'm just going to take my first sip. Taste the Hebrides in that. Lovely and smoky. Ooh, that warms the cockles anyway. Saving money on my heating bill. So let's get on to today's subject anyway. Intellectual rights, you're basically what you do and how you do it. So I get almost daily people messaging me and they say one of three things. Most common is how do you get the shots that you do? Then what camera do you use? Then where do you film it? And I'm going to explain to you why generally I don't say shit. (laughs) Which again, people might think you absolute asshole, Jack. Why would you not tell people? Well, I'll explain. The easiest one first is camera gear, because I generally, I do tell people camera gear, not everything, but I will tell people what camera gear I use. A lot of what I use is not on the shelf. It's all Heath Robinson cooked up. It's me tinkering around. I'm not an engineer. I don't know the ins and outs of bits and bobs, but I do have people who will help me potentially do these things. So the nature of my fish work, and this will come up a few times today, is what most people are interested in. So they always want to know, you know, what gear are you using it? Well, there isn't a fish starter kit or a fish filming starter kit. So it's all general camera gear that I've cobbled together, normally secondhand, and try to make it fit for purpose. What I would always say is that, particularly with this specialist stuff, people don't make cameras for specific wildlife needs. They might make a long lens for birds, but it might not necessarily work for something else. So what you do when you're looking to get a camera is look at the specific needs that you want for it and then try and find the camera that best fits those needs. 
And I always say, get what you can afford. There's no best camera for wildlife photography. It's the best camera for you and the best camera you can afford. And on a secondary note to that, I would always say spend your money on glass, on the lens, not the camera. Because cameras go out of date really quick, but if you get a decent lens, it could last you for years. For years and years and years. So people can ask me what I use. And, you know, I, 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 I use a Nikon D500 generally for the stills. And I use a Panasonic GH5S4 uh, for the filming. But that doesn't mean that they're the only cameras you can use for wildlife filming. It just happens to be the ones that I use. When it goes a level further is when people push me for, well, how do you get the shots? And this is when I start to get a little bit more defensive. Now, I realise that 99% of the people who ask me, how do you get those shots, are completely innocent and they're just curious. And I get that. I do honestly get that. But here's my counter to that. This is my full-time income. The only way that I make money is from filming and photographing wildlife. Most of the people who are asking me are not full-time wildlife photographers or filmmakers. They do it as a hobby or they're just interested. So let's say that I tell them the exact method that I film fish. There's lots of methods I do. It's no one method. It's five or six different ways of doing it. And then they go ahead and do it and they get some really nice footage. Good for them. And they put it online and then the BBC sees that and they buy that over mine or they offer them money for that over mine. I've essentially just shot myself in the foot because that person isn't going to go, oh, no, I don't want 250 quid. Um, no, thank you. You should go to Jack Perks. They're going to take that money. So even though people are not intentionally looking to fuck me over, that's what's going to happen. And the closest analogy I can compare it to is, would you ring a plumber up and say, excuse me, I would like to be a plumber. I want to get into plumbing. Can you tell me how to be a plumber? I'm not going to pay you or give you anything for your advice, but I would like your advice. And that's how I see it. Now, I realise I maybe sound a little bit cynical and maybe a bit paranoid, but it happens all the time. So if people do ask me these things, I try not to be rude. I mean, generally speaking, I just don't reply, which I suppose is a little bit rude. But I just know that if I just say to them, look, I don't want to tell you, then it's going to get awkward and arsy anyway. So I'd rather just not reply. But hopefully people can understand for that reason. To be honest, even if someone said to me, I promise you I won't put it online, I still wouldn't tell them anyway. Just It just doesn't benefit me. I mean, even if someone paid me, I wouldn't tell them. It's just not, it's not, there's no amount of money that would be worth me giving away my livelihood. So that's one of the reasons why I'm very, very guarded. Now, the caveat to that is I'm not doing anything crazy. I mean, you just look at the work that I do, you can pretty much work out how I do it. But it's amazing how there are simple things that I do that just people just haven't figured out, you know, it's and it's bonkers. And I'm like, well, surely you can work out how I'm doing this. But people still feel the need to get in touch. And I think sometimes it's because that they're a fan. They want to make contact with you. And I, and I do get that. I appreciate that. I'm always willing to talk to people if they are interested in the work that I do. But I think have something set out to say and think about what you're saying. Because if you're trying to imitate me, you're immediately going to put me on the back foot and that's going to make me my hair raise up a little bit. So I am always very cautious when people get in touch and all they want to know is how I film something or where I film something, which comes on to my third point. I'm very protective over locations. If you look on my Instagram, if you look on my YouTube, 99% of the stuff that I've done, I do not say where I filmed it. And there's always someone who goes, where did you film that? And I'm just like, go fuck yourself. I'm not telling you. And there's, there's, I suppose there's two reasons for it, potentially three. One, a lot of people are very gracious enough to share locations with me. And I'm a complete hypocrite because I will ask for, for locations as well. The difference is the people that give me those locations generally don't rely on those locations for an income photographically. Whereas when I find a location, it is an, it is an income for me. So I feel a, a care of duty, basically, that, or a duty of care, sorry, that I don't want to reveal that location and then have other people outside of my control ruining it, whether they damage the habitat, spook the animal, whatever. Which also comes on to poaching, because with fish, whether it's people catching fish for food or potentially uh, anglers fishing there too regularly and disturbing the fish, then I don't want that either. And obviously, if I film large fish, then a lot of anglers 
get um, a little bit excited and they want to know where it's filmed. So I don't, I don't reveal those locations out there. But there's also the case, of course, that I would be giving it away to other people to go and film. And these locations can take years, absolute years to find and perfect and get the right footage. Why would I just hand the keys to the car to someone who could just rock up, get there straight away and get that footage? There is no reason why I would do that. It's just bonkers. So that's why I don't... The only time I will reveal a location is either, one, if it's such a big location that you're not going to be able to find the exact spot anyway. So, for example, like the River Severn. I might put, I film Shad on the River Severn because it's such a big river. Good luck finding the exact spot. Although Shad's a poor example because you probably could find that spot. But you know what I mean. Um, or two, if it's something that everyone's filmed. So it doesn't really, you know starlings at ham wall or something like that like that's not particularly going to be a big problem for me so i will occasionally reveal locations but generally speaking i don't say shit now that's not to say that there isn't exceptions to the rule so if it's a close friend and someone that i trust then i might tell them because i know they're not going to screw me over and i've had it in the past where i have took people who uh, I know fairly well, and I'll take them to go filming, and vice versa. I mean, like Dan Rushton, who was on the podcast, he's got an amazing location for foxes, a species that I've done very little with, and he, he very kindly took me out, and we got some some really amazing stuff. But he knows that I'm not going to be going there without him. I don't live anywhere near it anyway, so I couldn't go there even if I wanted to. So I think that there is a level of trust sometimes, but you have to be so careful with people that you don't know, because ultimately... They could uh, they could screw you over, which is which is rather sad. And when you do come up with these ideas, whether it's like a filming idea or, or a certain thing, I do think it is better to act sooner rather than later because, you know, at the end of the day, we all work in a very small industry. There aren't that many wildlife photographers in the UK. There's probably professionally maybe a couple hundred in the grand scheme of things. So if you don't act on an idea, someone else will think of it. And this has happened to me loads of times when I've thought of something to do and I'm all ready to do it and then someone else has done it. And they've not copied me. It's just, you know, they've come to the same conclusion I've come to. And then it's like, well, if I do that now, it's going to look like I've copied them, which is so frustrating. Really, really, really frustrating when that happens. And sometimes I'll still go ahead and do it, knowing full well that people are going to think that I've just copied them when it's not the case. But it is annoying because you think, fucking hell, if I'd have just done that when I decided to do that, I could have avoided it. So it is a little bit frustrating when that happens. Now, obviously, when you've kind of mastered these ideas, you know, particularly when you're in a specialist route like the one I've gone down. I'm just going to have a little sip more of whiskey. Hang on. Oh, that's good. Goes down smoother each, each gulp. Then you will get people coming to you for ideas and advice and this is where intellectual property comes in and I get this semi-regularly with the BBC where I will have a researcher or a producer ring me up and they'll say could you tell me please where to find xyz or even how to do xyz and my first question will be okay are you intending me to use me for said piece often the answer is no and I'll be like, okay, then then you need to pay me intellectual property fee or a finder's fee, if you like. Because otherwise, the very harsh reality is, what's in it for me? Why would I tell you that? And I think the trouble is, so many people give up their information for free that it's expected now. When really, if you have got access or keen knowledge on something, uh, you should be paid for that. Of course you should be paid for that. So... And I have been paid. There's been a few times where production companies and the BBC have paid me. So they do do it. It's not something that they don't do. It's just they don't want to. I'd rather you just tell them. So generally, it depends how much power you have. So if they can go to someone else, they'll just go to someone else. But if you're the only option, then they'll fork out. They really hate doing it, but they will do it. So please don't be under the misconception that if you have an idea, that it's not worth anything. It is worth something. So if TV come knocking and they're like, we've seen that you are doing this, we'd like to send our crew out there, could you tell us where? You go, yeah, of course I can. 
here's the fee. There's no flat fee, you'd have to discuss it with them. It's not normally a huge amount, but you know, it's worth it's worth your time. And I've had this a few times over the years where, yeah, they have actually forked out, which is which is quite nice. It's frustrating because obviously I'd like to just film on them, but sometimes they already have crew set up, etc. So intellectual rights are, are really important. I think they're really important. I do try and be careful with what I put out as well because of the competition. Now, again, like I'm mainly talking about filming fish, but there aren't that many other people that do it. It's kind of more people coming up through the ranks. But you do have to be careful because, as I say, you just don't want to shoot yourself in the foot. Now, there's a very fine line, I find, when people get in touch. Because you'll get some people and they'll send you a fucking essay of an email. And they'll be brown nose into hell. You know, they'll be like, oh, you're a mate. And I'm like, you don't give a fuck about me. You just want to get whatever information out of me. Hate brown nosing. Can't stand it. I can. I don't like, I can't take a compliment either but you know like when someone is over that's not to say I don't like people saying nice things about me obviously but I don't like it when people are overtly brown nosing and I do get it occasionally I just, I just can't stand it but there's the other end of the scale where you've got people who like they'll message and they won't even do a how are you they're just like straight in where did you film that and there's no flowers there's no chocolate they're just going in no lube asking for that information I'm like fuck you how rude is that Go fuck yourselves. So I don't generally reply to those either. There's a fine line in between, a very, very fine line of genuine people who want to know about the subject and they don't want to screw you over. And I have encountered those and I have helped a few throughout my time. So I'm not completely heartless. There has been people I've helped because I can see that they're genuinely passionate or that I want to help them. For, for whatever reason. So there's been a couple throughout the years that I've helped. But most people, they fall into one of those first two categories. Either they just want to fucking get the information and, and not talk to you ever again, or they're brown nosing too hard. It's a, it's a funny little conundrum out there. I mean, I'll help people with stuff that I'm not an expert on, but then people obviously won't ask me for that. So if someone said, Jack, where can I film barn owls in Nottinghamshire? I'll tell you happily, because that is not going to affect me. But no one's going to ask me that sort of stuff. It's more the stuff that I specialise in that I'm a little bit guarded of and have to be uh, a little bit more careful about. So I am thinking about adding a, a frequently asked questions bit to my website and just putting, you know, uh, oh, I'm sorry I don't give out. Like, just because I, I get it all the time and it's just a bit like, you know, there's only so much you can handle. I've actually got it on my website as well where I've put I don't do things for free. If anyone's been on my website and you go on the contact me page, it says... Don't ask me for free stuff because I got asked constantly. I've already, if you go back through the podcast, I did do one about giving away stuff for free. So I got asked for that. So I might have to add a few more bits and just say, you know, like, don't ask me for free stuff. Don't ask me what camera I use. Don't ask me for the locations where I film things. And don't ask me how I do it. But I feel like, you know, there's maybe a simpler way of doing that. So it all can be a little bit tricky. Anyway, that was my shortish rant, my whiskey fueled rant. Mm. Oh, that is bloody good. I'm going to finish that bottle off. There's not a lot left, actually. There's only a little drab left, but I will definitely have the rest of that. Um, we are fast approaching the end of this second season. So I did say we're only going to do 20 episodes. So I think we've only got a handful left. And then we'll be coming back uh, later this year in the winter. I think probably about November again. I was hoping to come back sooner. Uh, but I've got a couple of big jobs on this year, which I need to kind of divert time to. So we've got a few more upcoming podcasts coming out, which I'm really excited to release. And then we'll be back in November. We'll probably have the odd bonus podcast in between now and then, so it won't be completely podcastless. And I am thinking of changing a couple of things. Um, I think I am going to keep Jack Does Stuff, but what I might do is interlace that with some other kind of special podcasts that I've got an idea I want to try and do something that involves bringing back some of the old popular guests and doing something a little bit more different. And obviously, we'll still have the kind of interview format for the normal podcasts. If you enjoy this podcast, you can follow us on Twitter, at TitBearded, and over on Facebook, The Bearded Tits Podcast. If you can leave a review, that's greatly appreciated. All the reviews we get help us with the search engines and pump us up in the ranks. Hopefully, you've enjoyed this bonus episode. I've been Jack Perks. This has been the Bearded Tits Podcast, and I'll see you next Tuesday. Cheers.